Osiris. Hello and welcome to Spotlight On, presented by Osiris Media. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today the spotlight shines on John Broder, leader of the music project Bird Streets. John first conceived of Bird Streets as his return to a band format after a long career as a solo artist. This new band point of view proved to be artistically freeing, and John joins us today to talk about Lagoon, the second Bird Streets album. Among John's collaborators on Lagoon are Pat Sansone of Wilco, Michael Lockwood, who's worked with Amy Mann and Fiona Apple, Ed Harcourt, John Davis of Superdrag, and even Jody Stevens of Big Star. Lagoon is a lush and complex record filled with moments of intense emotional vulnerability and second-to-none pop songwriting. John brought his openness and his storytelling ways to our talk, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Thank you for making time. It's great to talk with you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I was hoping maybe we could start... And I promise I won't dwell in this space too long, but I was wondering if we could start with just a little bit of biography and all of the prep I did learning about you and immersing in your music. I realized I don't know where you're from and how you got started. Sure. Well, I grew up in upstate New York near uh, this capital region, Saratoga, Albany area. I came up playing in bands up there from the time I was like 17, 18 years old. We had a few solo records while I was up there. I had a record called Tiger Pop that came out in the year 2000. That was my first full length recording. Played pretty much everything myself on that, inspired by people like Jason Faulkner and John Bryan and, you know, one man band types like that. And then a few band projects, a band called The Suggestions that lasted a few years. I had a band called Maggie Mayday that also lasted a few years and then ended up in New York at the end of the aughts and I started making music here. Bird Streets came about some years later after a couple more solo recordings kind of came and went and not much was happening with them. I just decided I needed a change and I had gotten to know Jason Faulkner through a mutual friend and we had known each other for a while. So it was just like natural thing to call him up and be like, Hey, why don't we, why don't we try some stuff? And that's the very short version of the biography. <laughs> yeah, we can dig in as much as you want. I, I just, I like to speed through things. <laughs> that, that's fair enough. Before I dive into some of the more Bird Street specific questions, um, just to set the table a little bit more, you said on, you know, in your early work, you played all the instruments. What was the first instrument you picked up? Well, when I was a, a little boy, drums was my first love. It wasn't necessarily the first thing that I studied or anything like that. I studied saxophone in grade school and, and up through a little bit of college, but I was always more rock focused. I got a guitar around my 12th birthday and, and sat down and taught myself some songs, just listening to the radio. And it was like this world opened up. I was like, that's where I'm going with this thing. And then I got a drum kit after that and a bass and, you know, just kind of learned my way around the rock and roll stuff. Are you one of those guys that can pick up pretty much anything and get a sound out of it? To a point, I'm not going to say I can do that with like a brass instrument so much. I might be able to. Um, you know, I, I'm sure I couldn't pull off the oboe. The double reeds always vexed me, but uh, yeah, I can fish something out. I don't know if I could play a song on anything, but I'll try it. I'll give anything a try. <laughs> yeah. Where'd your musicality come from? Did you grow up in that environment or was it a reaction to your environment? Or huh, A reaction. That's That's interesting. Yeah, my, none of my immediate family is musical. I have an uncle that plays, but I didn't really know him when I was little. I was sick growing up. I had leukemia when I was a little boy from the time I was two till I was six. And I'd been sick leading up to that. So I, I think I just sort of dove into the records that were around and immersed myself in the world of music. It was like those records are my best friends because I didn't really have a whole lot of, wasn't really socialized so much, you know, because I was just sort of always in bed or whatever. But so, yeah, I think it just came out of me as naturally over time. Like, that's what I wanted to do, and I found a way to do it. Yeah. Do you remember being sick? You know, bits and pieces. I don't remember the actual sickness. I remember bits and pieces of being in the hospital and nurses and different things, you know, some painful, some joyful. But, yeah, it's not, the, not my favorite topic, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty formative, though. I mean, it's, it's a big part of my life, so. 
Well, it's interesting because that helps me, I think, get my initial understanding of something I read that you said in another interview, maybe not directly in this context, but you referred to yourself as an album guy. I think you were talking about more as, you know, as an artist, you're an album guy. But I wonder, um, could you unpack that for me a little bit? Because obviously in this day and age, even our favorite artists, we don't always get through a full new album or certainly when everything was formatted to the CD. I I often felt like, you know, maybe if this was less album, (laughs) not a full 85 minutes or whatever, but you know, what's, what's it mean to you to be an album guy? There there was a little while there with the, in the nineties, especially with the CDs where people really took advantage of how long it could be. (laughs) It was, I'm uh, not sure everybody has 30 new songs every two years. (laughs) No, man. Like I remember like one of those Metallica records coming out and it had a sticker on the front. It was like, 76 minutes of music and i was like i don't know if i can do that i'm sorry there's probably artists i could but you know i grew up on on the beatles records and things that were conceptualized around a certain sound or style at a time the album just made sense as a body of work to me and as i started writing songs i don't know that i necessarily think that way when i'm writing songs but like in terms of like the actual writing part but when i'm putting together records i'm definitely thinking of like the whole feeling of listening to it in, in a and one fell swoop is sort of a, a movement versus individual songs, which I know is how people tend to actually listen to things. But, you know, so try to make it work both ways when, when I put a record together. I'm always fascinated, just like the music nerd in me around the idea that in the old days, albums were albums, you know, the first collections of, they were collections of songs of 78s of singles in an album, you know? Right. They were after the fact albums. Even up until the early Beatles, right? They'd put out singles and then some of them wouldn't even make it onto proper albums. The album format didn't really take hold until later 50s as a predominant thing. And definitely with the Beatles and Dylan, that became the major format. Yeah, you know, I I like the trip that you can can sit down and really tip that thing for 35, 40 minutes at a time. And I prefer artists that can make me want to do that versus, you know, Okay, enough of the same. Some artists, you, after a couple of songs, you're like, I've heard everything you're saying. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's always been, been the goal for me. To go under the hood a little bit at the risk of annoying you with like process questions. <laughs> I love them. I love them. A few things strike me about the new album. And one of the things that strikes me is that it's not necessarily still new. It came out in November, maybe. That's recent. But I wonder, like the entire process, the chapter. I guess I would think of it as, where are you at with the music? We're sitting here talking about it. It's part of what you have to do as a creative commercial being these days. Are you in the next chapter yet? Or are you still, you know, where are you with this music? I am thinking about the next chapter. I'm always thinking about the next thing because I've always got a bunch of songs that are sitting there that didn't make the last one. I probably have 40 or 50 songs or at least seeds that are close to songs. And I'm like, what am I going to do with that? Even as I'm finishing an album, I'm already on to the next one mentally. But with this record, because it's weird, because this happened so much on either side of the pandemic. The first nine songs, I think, were done before before COVID. And then there was a big break where we couldn't really do anything. The original plan was to do it all with musicians in studios. And that was no longer really a thing we could do at a point. And then we finished it, I guess, the beginning of last year and finally got it out in November. So it's been gestating for a long time. I've been sitting with the songs for a long time. However, I also haven't gotten to play them live a whole lot. Really, only done a handful of gigs since we started doing gigs again. I didn't, I, post-COVID, I didn't do a gig until June of last year. And, and since June, it's only really been four or five shows we've been waiting to get out on tour and stuff, which will be in the spring and summer this year. So... That is to say, the songs haven't worn out their welcome for me yet. There's still a lot of, like, they're still pretty fresh in a lot of ways. And it's, I still am enjoying playing them when I get to for people and seeing how they react to them in that context. I mean, I enjoy the feedback that people give me on the recordings, but that's a different thing when you get in front of people and, you know, you can see them feeling it. And it's something I'm still excited about. Yeah. It strikes me as an element of unfinished business with these songs. Like now, how do they stand up when I take them off the shelf and out into the road? Yeah, exactly. It's it's just a different world. I you know, I don't live for live performance. I love it, but also want to make more records. But I'm at that point right now where I'm just like, all right, now we got to start. We got to start playing more shows. 
and at the same time working on music for the next thing, which is, I want to try to keep things coming every couple of years. This one took four years because of, <laughs> because of a two year setback. So I'm like, all right, maybe we can get something out this year, <laughs> but we'll see how that goes. For you as an artist, how frozen in amber are the songs in terms of arrangement, exploration? Like when you take them out on the road, is there still evolution for the songs or is this performance of what you captured on record? You know, I'm still waiting to figure that out with this one. The shows that we've done so far, we've stuck to the arrangements that are on the record as much as you can with a record that's as, as produced as this is. Some of the arrangements are pretty lush. There's a lot of strings and Mellotron and lots of guitars, just as much as there was a lot of guitars on the first record. There's just as many on some of these songs. There's only so much you can do with four or five people. We've done most of the shows so far with five people. If we actually tour with the band, it'll probably be four. So we're going to have to do some real radical reimagining of, of how they go. But I'm also, yeah, you know, I'm not really tied to it. I want it's, the song is the song. And what goes on within it, you just pick the parts that are the most important. And the rest of the stuff's candy. So I try not to dwell too much on. I hear it when I play live. I hear the things that, that I know from the recording, but the important part is the vocal and the guitar and, or whatever the accompaniment is. And everything else just goes around that. I also suspect that to a certain extent, the segment of the audience that is familiar with your music, as opposed to somebody who's, you know, just being introduced at the gig. They hear those parts too. Like as an audience member, it gets filled in. You're not necessarily in real time obsessing about what's not there. Absolutely. <laughs> Unless you're one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> I can be one of those people. <laughs> I, I found myself in concerts before going like, where is the thing? You know, whatever. But yeah, I think most people understand it. I can't remember what song it was, but I remember playing one of these songs at our release show in November and hearing one of the parts sung from the audience. <laughs> and I was like, that's amazing. Like when somebody like hears a part and that part is so important to them and you're just, it's just an after, afterthought to you as, as the, the composer or whatever, you know, that was just a little thing we threw on there because it filled that space nicely. But for the listener, like maybe that's, you know, that's the thing that makes it. So it's, it's kind yeah. of fun to, to have that play with it. Yeah, that's neat. There are some of the tracks that when I hear them, I think, oh, that's going to be fun to play live. And probably the biggest one that strikes me that way just in terms of like getting your rock on is machine. Like I would mm -hmm. like to be on stage and bang out some of those riffs. <laughs> that one is a blast to play live. I love that one. Yeah. On this record, there's not as much of the, um, the first record was a little more power pop. So there was, there was a few more like anthemic type songs, but there's really only one or two of those on this record. But that, that one is, that was a blast to play in front of people. Staying with the theme of, of an album, the sound is really something else. The mixing on it is, um, you said lush and you referred to there being sort of a lot of production or instrumentation with the Mellotron and other things. And I'm curious, do you sit on the mixes? Like, are you there or do you prefer somebody gives you a mix to respond to and react to? I've tried it both ways. You know, when I'm working with Jason Faulkner, like I did on the first record, I was there for most of the mixing. We did it all pretty much in the room. On this one, especially because a lot of the mixes ended up being remote, because they had to be, I kind of let that go. And yeah, actually, most of this was just done with notes going back and forth between me and Pat Sansone and me and Michael Brower. I kind of, I kind of prefer it that way. I kind of like to take myself out of it. I've done my part and let's hear how somebody else hears it. And when you got a guy like Michael Brower mixing your songs, he's one of the, the best there ever was. So it usually comes back and you're like, that's great. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. But you know, it's all, it's all what you put into it and then if it comes back a little weird then you can be like can, can you just take a little of the weird out of it or, or whatever <laughs> add more weird to it whatever it is it's a fun collaboration that way versus me standing over the shoulder of the person mixing it and just being like oh can i hear more guitar here and you know the person will be like i'm not done yet <laughs> that's usually how i know how i work and i know how i can be in those situations and i, I think it's probably better this way if i'm just here you have your creative say on it and then we'll talk about it the analogy or the obvious analogy that comes to mind for me is filmmaking like you sound much more like you're taking a filmmaker's approach and turning the rough footage over to the editor and saying return me a cut and i'll, I'll let you know how it flows yeah yeah it's, it's just more interesting 
my part, I, especially with this record, I tried to be more just the songwriter, more just the singer, guitar player, whatever, but rather than getting into every little nook and cranny of the process, which is part of why I wanted to do it in studios, at least do basic tracks with real musicians live in the studios. So there wasn't as much nitpicking as it went along. It would just be like, that is, that feels good. Let's just go with that. And it's the same thing with the mix. So, you know, I just want to hear what, you know, everybody's got creativity to bring to it. And if I'm there, it's going to be more me trying to impose my voice on it, which I've already done at that point. I'd just rather turn it over. My sort of final question on that line of inquiry, could you tell me a little bit about the sequencing? Because that's another part of this record that works really well. I appreciate that. No, it really does. There's a there's an emotional narrative that that sits outside of just the music and the lyrics. Like the flow to the record's very strong. And so how does that come about? Is that Pat? Is that you? Is it a collaboration? Uh, no, in fact, that's one place where I rarely take outside input. I yeah, I, I tend to when I'm piecing the thing together, especially a record like this where it was a lot of different parts, a lot of different songs. There there was another eight songs or something like that that were in the running, were in the mix. So it was, you know, kind of putting the, moving the pieces around a lot until yeah. it made sense. And even up to the last, even when we were getting it mastered, after I got the first master back, I was like, swap these and swap these up until the last minute. Cause it was just like, and then it fell into place as it does. Yeah. I, I guess I saw this as sort of an emotional arc, like certain songs. When I imagined the record, when I was making this, making the recordings, I saw them in different places. Like ambulance was originally supposed to be like near the end of the record. Go free was going to be like at the beginning of the record. And then, you know, as things happened and more songs came in, like the last couple songs that I did with Michael Lockwood, uh, unkind and sleeper agent, once those fell into the puzzle, it felt that like sleeper agent. As soon as we recorded that, I was like, Oh no, this opens the record. And then maybe go free is like the little ray of light at the end of it to take us out of this really kind of dark place that we've been in for 45 minutes. Yeah. Sequencing is a big thing. That's, that's goes back to the, you know, I'm an album guy. I want it to be a trip versus just, just a bunch of singles, you know, smashed together. This was a challenge with Lagoon because it's a lot of different types of songs, a lot of different sounds. So make, making that. I, I, it was a little weird putting like San Francisco, which is like this kind of 1973, like songwritery song into ambulance, which is like a mid nineties grunge song almost. And, uh, you know, the disappearing act, which is my first tentative step into like kind of making soul music, all these different things going together. But yeah, it's all, it all comes down to, to, to pacing and sequencing. And that, that was, it took a lot of work, but I feel like, I feel like we got it. Yeah. It paid off. You've spoken elsewhere about both at the individual level and collectively about these songs and about what you were going through and what they're the sort of, I guess, aftermath of a reaction to in terms of your personal life. I did want to just ask a couple, I wanted to ask about a couple of songs in particular, and I should preface the whole thing by saying there were definitely a couple of times when I listened to the album and I said, I think I want to put the recording on pause and ask John if he's okay. <laughs> You're not the first person to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard this before. Yeah, that's, that's something that comes up. And uh, this is my way of working through shit. So I write songs to uh, to get those things out, you know. Yeah. You mentioned one. I'm curious about what was San Francisco 1993? That's an interesting one because it feels so real. <laughs> and it's totally just an imagined thing. Oh, I love um, that. Yeah, it, but it, in the context of the record, in the context of what I was going through, it was actually written prior to my split up from my wife, and I sat on it for a few years till I finished it. Yeah, it definitely feels like something that would fit right in with these other songs. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really know where it came from. I just had this idea. I had this first line, this first verse that kind of came out, and then it just flowed from there. The chorus took a long time. That's why it took a while to finish, you know, four or five years till we finished it, because I didn't know where it was supposed to go in the chorus. And I think when I sent the song to Pat, I sent him four or five different versions of the chorus, of different, wow. completely different ideas until he was like, that, I think that's the one, you know. I wish I had a better story for it, but it's really, it really was just, it was just imagination on that one. It's interesting because the themes and the ideas in the record around processing your experience and 
the looking back and reflection, however you want to thematically summarize it or however people are doing that for you. Mm -hmm. Um, It's this one. It's almost like it's like a fake nostalgia, not fake in a it's not a it's not a condemnation, but it's a in the context of all these songs that have genuine nostalgia or or rumination. This one is a it's interesting. I I don't know what it means, but it's interesting. Yeah, and I suppose there was, you know, there was a certain amount of real feeling that goes into it because I, you know, I, we all ruminate over something that could have gone a different way. I'm obsessed with the idea of alternate timelines and stuff. So there was certainly a little bit of that that played into it. As I was writing it, I could visualize the characters and the locations and stuff. I put, I put kind of real locations into this song and built it up as this sort of little short story. But when it comes down to it, it's all it is. It's just a... It's just this thing. It's just sort of like a one-sided conversation, you know, which a lot of the songs on this record are. A lot of the songs about about my ex-wife, at least. So it narratively fits squarely within that realm. It's, it feels like it just came out of that same period. Maybe I shouldn't give it up. Maybe I should Maybe I should just say that it was, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I love that song. I was interested to see how people would react to that song because it's very different from not only anything on the record, but anything I think that I've recorded before. It's nice to hear that people like it. When you say one-sided conversation, is that, are they conversations that you didn't get to have or just it's too late to have or? In that one, it's sort of an, it's almost too late. I envisioned it as two estranged lovers, or at least one of them, trying to reconnect with the other after a long period of time, trying to say like, hey, can we start over? And the line, um, I, I am forgetting my own lyrics right now. <laughs> the, the line at the end of the second verse about, you know, like, I wish we had more time, but, or whatever. Gosh, I wish I could remember the actual lyric right now to quote it. <laughs> it would be a lot. This You're going to edit this, right? Uh, a little uh, now bit. Now I am. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, hang on. Let me, let me pull it up. Because I want to quote myself properly before I screw this up. The line is, maybe a few more years would do us good, but I'm afraid to say that's all we got. And the idea was like, these are people like later in life, maybe the narrator in this song is sick or dying or whatever. And he's going back and, and reflecting on his life and being like, boy, this could have been a lot different if we'd, we'd just, I don't know, talked about it or whatever it was. So that's, that was the kind of impetus there as somebody who does a lot of, a lot of ruminating, a lot of thinking about, like I said, alternate timeline sets. Um, yeah. It, it took me to a real emotional place when I thought about that. So. Yeah, I would say, you know, as a person who, one, is of a certain age, two, has what I assume without probably sharing all the specifics of the situation has been through a lot of what you convey in these songs and what you've revealed in your in your other interviews and in discussions, the immediacy and the realness of what's coming through in these songs. Like, again, as someone who's lived a lot of it, it's very, yeah, I hear New York in the background. It's always there. <laughs> It's very authentic. Um, well, I guess, yes, the authenticity of, of the experience comes through, for sure. The immediacy of those feelings. It, it took me, it was very visceral, for sure. Part of it is just processing things. Part of it is, so, like a lot of these songs, like I said, one-sided conversations. These are things that I wish I could say, or in some cases, wish I had said. And part of putting them out there, this, I mean, because it's a pretty vulnerable record, part of putting that out there was is getting that kind of response back from other people that are like, yeah, I feel that I've been there. I can connect with that. That that's been a really important part of the process too, for me, not just being like, this is all how I feel, but like knowing that it's like, oh yeah, other people feel this way too. We've all gone through something. If not a divorce, it's, we've all had a breakup that ruined us at some point. So like, you know, you can get in under the hood on that. So yeah. Yeah. That's a big part of it. We will be back with more Spotlight On, presented by Osiris Media, after this break. And now, back to Spotlight On. Another song that, along the lines of Vulnerable, but also, in in a strange way, a big fun song is Burnout, in terms of the music. And as I was listening to it, or one of the times I listened to it, it occurred to me, it has that strange potential, especially when you put it in front of an audience, to become a song that's taken the wrong way. Sure. And is it becomes an anthem. <laughs> I can hear that. Uh, yeah. And uh 
Obviously, it's not. It's not, but <laughs> <laughs> not not even remotely so. Uh, it's 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 one of the more self loathing songs on the record. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's it's got this sort of chant in the last uh, the last minute or so of the song that I could see people sort of taking as almost like a rallying cry. It's not that obviously. Yeah, that was a fun song to um, flesh out because I heard it as more almost like a punk rock song, and then. Pat heard it a different way, and when we started producing it, it was like, oh, it's it's almost got like Echo and Bunnyman vibes. It's a very 80s kind of almost gothy music bed to it. So it, it put it more in, in its proper place, I think. Whereas if it had been more of a rock song, it probably would. People would hear it that other way, for sure. But I think I give it away at the end of the, of the second verse on that, where, you know, you get high and I wonder why nothing gets me high, you know, after all these other. Yeah, that's pretty good. It just felt like that kind of put a little bow on it. If you if you were wondering what, how I was approaching it, that gives it. it that prevents it from becoming your uh, your rainy day women. It's not everybody <laughs> must get stoned. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Before I, I I leave the realm of of the individual songs, I, there's two more I want to ask about. One is um is leave no trace. Okay. I don't even know where to begin there. Why don't I turn it over to you? Tell me about leave no trace. Okay, so Leave No Trace was written as part of a writing project for this group called Bushwick Book Club. It's a group of folks that do musicians and poets and artists that get together. I don't know if they do monthly anymore, but it used to be kind of monthly, and they would all pick a book every month, and everybody would write and perform a piece based around that, that book. Oh, wow. So use it as a prompt. Yeah, exactly. And it was the first time I think I'd ever tried something like that. And I got invited to do one based on Jonathan Ames' novella, You Were Never Really Here, which was later turned into a movie with uh, Joaquin Phoenix. Both versions are fantastic. The book, part of the reason I jumped into it, besides I'm a Jonathan Ames fan, was it's 110 pages. It's a very easy read. I read it twice in one night. And it's so evocative and it's so dark. The uh, protagonist in the story is uh, like a He's a vet. He's got P severe PTSD. He's major self-loathing. He, he has suicidal ideations throughout the book. this short book. It comes out a lot. And he's uh, in the business of saving young girls from like sexual slavery. It's a pretty fucked up book. It's a wow. really messed up. Yeah. And uh, I didn't get into that part of it, but as I read the book and, and, and tried to get inside the mind of the character, I, you know, I certainly found myself connecting with some of the dark thoughts that, that sometimes we have. And I just tried to, to write from that point of view and do it with the same kind of concise, you know, it's just, like I said, it's a, sh it's a very brief read. And so I tried to write with as, you know, as few words as possible, just make it brief, make it evocative in that way. As I played around with it, I had a couple of different musical ideas, but then I, I I had a guitar that was in double drop D because I'm a Neil Young nerd. I just picked it up and just started playing this thing. And this little descending thing came out and I was like, all right, let's just roll with this. And there then the song, the song was done in 20 minutes after that when you know, the lyric was there for a while, but musically it just happened very quickly once, once I found it. Wow. It's interesting then to hear that story in the context of the next song I wanted to ask you about, because this is where I think you get the, you're going to get the Eminem award for couplets, which is you've managed to find words to rhyme with anonymous huh. <laughs> and that, that are not hippopotamus. <laughs> okay. All right. The next, so, I know what the song is. Yeah. So disappearing act. There's a lot of the, a lot of language and thematic elements in that song that seem to be informed by a certain secret society or group that deals with some of the issues in the song. I wonder how familiar you are with, with, the, with the, with the group of people who seem to espouse some of the same philosophies in the song. <laughs> I don't know how else to ask you, but you, you express very, uh, very specifically, I want to say turmoil, but also the, it's a, it's an insight. It's a look inside what happens to someone who's caught up in that. That's a tough one. That's this disappearing act is this one song. And there's some heavy tunes on this record. It's the song that I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to sing this every night <laughs> on tour, yeah. even though it's, it's got this great big chorus and it's made to be performed live in that way like lyrically it's pretty heavy um 
I quit drinking 10 years ago, 11 years ago almost. So it's written, looking back at that, at having hit the bottom a few times, so to speak. But it's also, it's also written from the perspective of feeling like you've, hmm, this is, this is tough. Um, feeling like that's wasted time and feeling like you have been just spinning your wheels. And I've written about that before with that period in my life, but this is written with another eight or nine years hindsight on that and feeling in some ways, like, am I any further ahead now than I was then? Did I, has this improved my life really? Besides the fact that I don't wake up with hangovers? Yes. Yes, it has. I'll just say that no hangovers. Great. Would never go back. Best decision I ever made. But sometimes it's when you're still like pushing the same rock up the same hill as an indie musician, it's, it's like, what am I, what am I doing? <laughs> so there's a little bit of both things there. It's kind of two different tacks. If your question was, <laughs> do I go to meetings? I, I don't. <laughs> I never did. I did one, one meeting after I quit. I went with a friend who'd been sober for about 10 years at that point. She took me to the meeting. I sat through it and I was like, I don't think this is for me, but, um, you know, everybody's got their way and those are great for a lot of people. And I, mean, I wouldn't talk smack on it. I just, I just have to do it in, in here. I have to do it inside yeah. and, and write my way through it or whatever, you know? Thank you for that. It's interesting in that, you know, a lot of people talk about how you get, there's an amplification, right? Like when you drink and you're, you think your personality becomes bigger and you become more gregarious and fun and you know, right. the life of the party kind of thing. So, so you think. Yeah, exactly. But most people aren't doing it to do that. They're doing that to obliterate themselves. They're doing that to disappear because there's something so something that's not working correctly for them. Yeah. And I think that's, that was a big part of when I finally put it down. It was like, wait a minute. I, this isn't fun. It's not, I'm not having fun. <laughs> I am just trying to find the bottom again or whatever. You're just trying to like put myself to sleep. So <laughs> yeah, trying to remember who to apologize to sucked. I hated that. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> I, I'll be honest. I got lucky in some ways. I, at least I've been told a lot of people told me like, you never seemed like a, never seemed like a total mess. And I was like, I guess I, I guess in that way I held it pretty good, held my liquor. I don't think that's a good fit. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of wish I was more of a mess because somebody might have said something sooner, you know. Yeah. Do you create in any other media? Do you are you know? Do you paint? Do you draw? Do you are you film it? Because you speak very uh, visually. Like you, you sounds like your process is very similar to a visual artist. And I'm just curious if you work in other fields. I don't. I'm not a creator in any other fields. I work in film sometimes, but not as a filmmaker. I do some background work as a day job. You may see me crossing the street in your favorite TV show sometime. Um, <laughs> are you the cor Are you the corpse on Law and Order? <laughs> I haven't been a corpse yet, and that is sort of one of those boxes I've been waiting to check. That's how you know you made it in New York. I, that's that's at least it, it's sort of a, a rite of passage. Yeah, I, you know, I, I I think of the songwriting as my writing. I, I do sometimes dabble in in, in attempts at prose or of a screenplay that's been sitting in a a document file for a hundred years like anybody else. But yeah, I haven't really pursued it. I've talked about maybe trying to paint or something, but I've never really gone after it. I just, I obsess over lyrics. I spend a long time writing lyrics and rewriting them, and reworking them. And a lot of times I'm reworking them until I'm standing in front of the microphone recording them. And I'll be like, Hey, take it back. I got to say something different here. It's probably a lot of the way that a lot of rappers work. It's the same thing. It's just like, I want to make it more rhythmic, more interesting, you know, more descriptive, more evocative. So that's, that's, I just pour it all in there. That's very interesting to hear you say, because you do write your lyrics in a variety of like approaches or styles. So there are some lyrics that are much more compressed or sparse. And, and then there are other songs like Disappearing Act, where there's a lot of syllables packed into each line. Yeah. You know, you're saying a lot, not only meaning, but you're literally saying a lot. It's very interesting that, that you don't have just one, there's not just one way you do it. I think maybe that's part of the reason that I don't 
work in other disciplines so much just because it's every time I write a song, it, it feels a little different. I don't have a tried and true process necessarily. Like some wrong, some writers just go to the piano every day and write, and that's just how they do it. And, you know, some people are very lyrics first or very music first or whatever. I, it's, it's it really is a little different every time for me. So it keeps it interesting, keeps it fresh. It keeps me wanting to do more of it. Yeah, I would imagine. A couple other things I was hoping to ask you about. Bird Streets as a thing, as a concept. As a concept, right. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the most plain way to ask is, is like, what's the why? And I think you, you started to answer it earlier in terms of, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I feel the need to say that I heard you. That was essentially, it was like, a, it was just, you needed a change of pace or something along those lines. But like, why start a whole new brand when it's not really a proper band per se? Yeah. Well, I ask myself that almost every day. Um, <laughs> I'm like, why did I just like basically erase 16 years of work? <laughs> it's if you look at the internet, it's almost like I didn't exist until 2016, but um, not true. You know, it was, it really was just a, it was a change of pace. I had put out a bunch of different things. I'd made four different solo records. I'd done these different band projects that came and went. The last solo album I did, Little Hopes, just sort of came out and dropped like a stone. I felt like it just didn't do anything. And so it just felt like time to start thinking about what can I do next that takes it in a different direction. And I imagined Bird Streets originally as, as a band. I'd actually started it as a band at the end of like 2015. And it was intended to be that. But at the same time, I also started up working on this record with Jason Faulkner. And, you know, the name Bird Streets came from a place in Los Angeles when I was first working with him a couple of years prior to that. So that felt like Bird Streets. So I was like, maybe it's both of these things. And then it was like, maybe that's just my name for it going forward. You know, maybe it's better to just hide behind a band name. It looks better on a T-shirt and a kick drum than just John Broder. I'll wear a Bird Street shirt. I wouldn't wear a John Broder t-shirt. It was living these two parallel lives. And I was just like, just, I'm just going to make it the umbrella for whatever I do going forward. I feel like in the long run, it was a good decision, but it definitely <laughs> cost me a lot of agita for a while. Like, is this a good idea at this point in a career to just be like complete, you know, 90 degree, like, okay, we're going over here now. Even though it's the same thing, it's the same guy writing the songs and the songs have a lot of the same you know, emotional threads of some of the other stuff that I've done. It just, it just made sense. And I feel in a lot of ways, like I've kind of um, opened myself up a lot more in the songs and in ways that I don't think I did in work before that. I mean, it also is just live and learn and, and get better at the craft. But like, I, I don't think I could have put my name on a song like Disappearing Act five, six, seven years ago before this. Calling it Bird Streets just makes it a little easier to just be like, yep, yeah, okay, that's me. But it's also got a little bit of a of a of a shell around it. It's like you're Gene Simmons. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> or not. Never yeah. say that. Oh. <laughs> the Donald Trump of rock and roll. Yeah, unbelievable. <laughs> um, we could go down that. But you know, it's interesting. I spoke to another <laughs> artist recently, more in the electronic field, and he performs under a stage name as well. And he said something very similar. It basically allows him to be a version of himself that he might not otherwise be. In his case, he was a little more specific in terms of how he can behave on stage. He's more reserved in quotes in real life, but having sure. this alter ego allows him to express parts of himself that he might be too self-conscious about. Yeah. I don't know that I necessarily have that same physical transformation. I, I feel like I'm still the same dude on stage, but yeah, it, it was like, I thought of groups like Nine Inch Nails or World Party that was like, it's it's one guy, but it's also a band. It can be all these different things depending on how you approach it. You know, it's a cool little name to put on things versus yeah. versus feeling like I got, I'll just hang myself out there every day. Do you have a future concept for it in terms of like, would each project be you and a different producer or do you see it settling in on something more stable or do you even need to think about what it will evolve into? I prefer not to. It's opened a lot of doors. It's allowed me to, it's allowed me to work with a lot of people that I didn't know that I was going to be able to work with in the past. 
you know, getting to work with Pat, getting to work with Michael Lockwood, folks like that wouldn't even have been on my radar in terms of like my ability to connect with those people six, seven years ago. I kind of want to just kind of keep pushing down that path. I, it's enabled me to send the emails that I might have sat on for a lot longer and just be like, Hey, you want to do something? And a lot of people are like, yeah, I'll do it. I just, I kind of want to just, you know, keep expanding the circle. I'm going to do, you know, I'll probably do records with a single producer at different times. Like I actually have another half a record that I've worked on with Jason Faulkner that we're probably going to finish later this year and a couple other projects that are boiling up, you know, we'll see how I approach them, but I like just trying different stuff, seeing what sticks. Yeah. One of the things I really enjoyed about digging into the music and especially with Lagoon was that there's like a sense of lineage, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I can hear where you came from or what you, what informed you, but not in a derivative way. I always like that. Not always. I mean, I, I it's not a requirement for me in what in my listen as a listener, yeah. but it's, I find it fun. I guess I would say is that it's neat to be able to to have the way station or the signpost of familiarity as a way in. Yeah. But then to have the next version of it evolve. So whether it was hearing a little bit of Amy Mann or obviously Big Star, or I actually, I was, there was a playlist that you had on the website and it was a mixture of your songs and then clearly music you liked or people in your universe. And I was surprised that I didn't see the Jayhawks because I hear a lot of Gary Loris oh, nice. in the guitar playing too. That's a really nice thing to say. I love Gary Loris and I love the Jayhawks. I made that playlist that you're speaking about. I, I didn't include the Jayhawks because I haven't worked with any Jayhawks yet. But, you know, ah. if you're listening, Gary, <laughs> I love your songs. I would love to write with you someday. Yeah, I, I just I kept that to people that have been in in the universe played or contributed to the records. So, you know, Amy and a big star, you know, Jody, Jody played on, on Brady's songs and, and Will Cope had a lot of different things like that. But I try to like synthesize the different things through my own voice. So you don't just hear me copying somebody else's, you know, vibe. Although a song like Go Free, I wrote that knowing I was going to Memphis to record at Arden with Jody playing drums. I was trying to write a big star song a little bit, even though it probably came out a little more like Matthew Sweet, but oh, he's another, another one. What a another favorite. And like, actually one of the things when I was putting the sequencing together to go back to one of the things I thought about was his album, Altered Beast, which is a big, long record that is another kind of, it's a journey. It's got some real dark spots, some real bright spots, and it goes through the whole range. And it's another record that, that Jody plays on that was recorded in that same room. So, or at least parts of it. But also because he recorded that album in a bunch of different places. It's one of those. So I was like, we, this can be done. It can all go together and make sense. But yeah, I, I listen to a lot of music. I listen, the, probably the only thing I listen to that you don't necessarily hear in my own music, although you brought up Eminem before. I listen to a lot of hip hop. I listen to, to everything, you know, but things like, you know, I'm a huge Elliott Smith fan. I feel like that comes through sometimes, but I don't feel like I sound like Elliott Smith. Or, yeah, I wasn't, am a huge Radiohead fan which you might hear a little bit here and there on the guitar playing or the way that we approach different textures, but I don't think any of my stuff really sounds like them. Maybe a little bit on ambulance might sound a little like the bends, but that was intentional. But yeah, I try, I try to like, you know, filter it all through my point of view and it comes out like it comes out. It's, it's very interesting to hear you speak about it that way though, because you, there's an element to um, the fact that you're able to do that. Like you could conjure, you could say, I'm going to write a song for Jody Stevens that's going to be my take on a big star song. Now, lots of people can try to do that. <laughs> sure. Um, but to be effective at it's another thing. And that's a really interesting harnessing of your capabilities and like focusing of your talent. To be able to deliberately conjure it that way, it's kind of interesting. It's impressive. It happens once in a while. <laughs> it does, doesn't always work that way. That was one of those lucky lucky breaks but yeah where it was just played a d chord and then played the chord that naturally came after it. and it was like oh that's okay i know where this is going with that type of song it's a little easier i feel like for at least for me because i probably the most foundational music for what i do and what i love is power pop music and big star and matthew sweet like i mentioned an artist like that where it's just great melodies and guitars and it's a good home base to come back to just naturally happens for me but 
I know what you're saying. I know it's, it's not that way for everybody. So yeah, I consider myself lucky that way. Is there a big star song that if you could wear it on your sleeve, you would, is there like, do you have a big star anthem? It's probably the ballad of El Gudo. Mm. I mean, God, there's so many good ones. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll probably just say that. I think that's the one that I, I circle back to the most often. I, I can't that hear it enough times. ridiculous. Like the crafting of it, the production. I mean, every, if you take that song and just lift it out of what came before, what came after, and just listen to that, it's 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 really like <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. It's it's perfectly written, perfectly played, and perfectly recorded. It's. I mean, that whole album, that those, those first two records are both like that. But that first record especially just sounds incredible. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I bounce between that when my baby's beside me. Yeah. And I've recently been very obsessed with 13. Like, that song is another sure. one. Like, these oh. are the, any, any of these songs. I mean, these are all songs that I have learned and played and performed a million times. That I just, they're just bedrock for me. So, yeah, absolutely. But Did you ever see Chilton? I got to see one of the, I think it was the last time Big Star played in New York and it may have been their last actual gig because they didn't do a lot of gigs. That show in Brooklyn at the Masonic? Yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. there. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. yeah. They did. I don't, know, I don't know if they played again after that. He, he died four months later. I was, I was actually on stage when, when I got a text from my friend Luther and he was like, Alex is going. I was like, I stopped what I was doing. I was like, what? I think I might have played 13 at that point. I was just like, I got to do this right now. Yeah, I guess one of the one of the best there was. And Chris Bell. I mean, I feel like Chris Bell like kind of gets, you know, because Alex Chilton's shadow looms a lot, lo you know, a lot longer. But Chris Bell was such an amazing writer. I mean, the guy in the cosmos, that whole album. Just, yeah, I, I can't say enough about it. So, yeah, that's the thing right there. Yeah, I saw some bizarre shows with him over the years with 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 Alex. With Alex. I saw him. I think I can't remember the exact lineup because a few of those shows are mixed together, but. There used to be a band that played around um, the East Coast called uh, the Upper Crust. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I saw him open for that. He was on a bill. I think it was Alex Chilton, the Upper Crust, and Question Mark and the Mysterians. Oh, how strange. <laughs> and, and is this Alex doing like his like R&B stuff? Or? Yeah, Tina Nina New and all that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's an interesting bill. I never get to see the crust, but uh, I, yeah, I heard a lot about them. And I'll tell you what. I mean, <laughs> phenomenal, phenomenal, I, phenomenal. I, I, I love it when you, you know, I love when someone can commit to a bit and that, that is a great bit. It was full on. Yeah. Thank you so much, John Broder. And as always, thank you for listening to Spotlight On. We're presented by Osiris Media. Our executive producers are me, Lawrence Purrier, RJB, Brian Brinkman, and Matt Dwyer. Our producer is Michael Donaldson, and our theme music is by Q-Burn's Abstract Message. If you like what you've heard, please share us with a friend and leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. Visit us online at SpotlightOnPodcast.com or at SpotlightOnPod on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Be safe and stay in touch. Osiris.